welcome to Find, Tell, Share, the Storytellers podcast, where we meet entrepreneurial artists who share their stories as we discuss everything storytelling. I'm Gemma Rosenthal. And I'm Chris Sissons. On today's show, we explore how World Vegan Market, a lockdown project, inspires conscious consumers around the world. We explore monetary and emotional support for artists and the personification of artificial intelligence. And this time, we're delighted to introduce our guest, Shabiri Das. Shabiri Monica Das is a visionary entrepreneur who inspires to make a real difference in the world. She's been vegan for 26 years and has also been a passionate about animal rights, human rights and green issues. She is the founder and manager of World Vegan Market, leader of the London Vegan Business Network, founder and owner of Shabiri's Snack Shack, green beauty ambassador of Shabiri Loves Tropic and founder and owner of Ethi Green. She is a published academic author and has written a research paper about greenwashing. She started the World Vegan Market as a way to support vegan businesses and make veganism more accessible to everyone. The market has grown rapidly since its launch and now has a global audience of thousands. Welcome to Find, Tell, Share, Shabiri. Thank you very much, uh, Gemma and Chris. Delighted to be on your show. Thank you. Um, so tell us a little bit more about what led you to get into veganism. What was the moment when you decided to become vegan? Have you always been vegan or was there a moment? Um, I wasn't actually born a vegan. Um, I became vegan uh, 26 years ago. I was already a vegetarian for a couple of years at the time. And um, I actually thought that um, being a vegetarian was enough. Um, You know, I I became vegetarian uh, during the final year at uh, uh, university. And, um, you know, and then I I kind of didn't... to, to be honest, um, at the time, I thought that uh, I, I myself actually thought that veganism was a little bit too extreme. Um, that was until I went along to the Kingston Green Fair, um, which is a, a local uh, green fair that happened uh, every year. And uh, there was an animal, there was somebody with an animal aid stall. Animal aid is one of the largest um uh, animal rights um, organizations in the UK. Um, they have a big um, educational department and they have a, a school speakers program as well. And um, lots and lots of resources um, uh, about educational resources um, and uh, recipes, uh, vegan recipes, etc. And um, so I went up to the stall and uh, I picked up some literature about the cruelty of the dairy industry and the cruelty of of the egg industry and um and it really actually opened up my eyes um uh, about uh, about both those industries and um and so the next logical step was actually to to go vegan and uh yeah so um that actually you know if i hadn't have gone there i, I probably would would have um you know, known about veganism perhaps further down the line, but um, but you know, um, it really did open up my eyes. Um, reading that that literature and that uh, actually started me on my vegan journey. And um, and I actually found that um, physiologically I was changing as well because um, you know, already my body was re- uh, had rejected meat and then fish um, and then prawns. I was getting, you know, I had already um like a I was already a, a vegetarian um at the time but um but I physically couldn't eat uh, eat those products anymore and then you know with um with the eggs um uh, side of things as well I actually found that I developed a um 
or almost like a, an allergy to, to eggs. And I, I think what it was, was that because I read that literature, everything kind of shifted, you know, um, both physically, physiologically, and uh, and also um, psychologically uh, as, uh, as well. So everything kind of changed um, from that moment. And uh, yeah, that's why um, I became vegan. Yeah, I, I think it's fascinating, isn't it? And do you think that the reason why people aren't vegan or tend to be vegetarian more than more than vegan, do you think it's a lack of education or do you think it's just a resistance? What do you think the resistance is to becoming vegan? Um, because even in myself as well, I'd say I'm probably more vegetarian than vegan, although I do try my best to have vegan milk and when I can cheese as well um vegan cheese as well so I guess like even within myself I've sort of noticed this resistance or this kind of like um even when you have the information um there seems to be this oh it's too hard or you you know what if I don't get the nutrients I need or just this you know well all my family are eating cheese and I you know it's a it's a pain if I ask you do you know what I mean mm, so, mm. um I just wondered what your thoughts or advice is for people who want to go vegan um but maybe have that those resistances well that's one but also what about the people that just have that um kind of just disregard of the information about the cruelty well um you know that's a very uh, in interesting point, um, uh, Gemma. Um, yes, uh, the the thing is, most of us are not actually uh, born vegan, and um, and you know, I I would say that for for most of us. Um, meat eating and fish eating is is very much um in, ingrained you know somebody uh, sorry something needs to change um in inside of you that um that makes you that would make you um you know uh, like her uh, actually um implement that change and um and it can take um a long long time um you know it, for, for me uh, yes, uh, like um, I, I actually wanted to become vegetarian um, when I was at school and I wasn't able to do it. Um, and then I, I, I finally became a vegetarian during the final year at university. And then um, and then a few years later, a couple of years later, I became vegan after reading um, literature. That might not happen for everyone, Um that's very true. Uh, but, um, you know, everyone's on, on their journey. Those who, um, are wanting to actually become, uh, vegan, um, uh, but, uh, uh, who are finding it difficult. Um, I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, sort of like give yourself a, a hard time, you know, um, baby steps, every little step, you know, even like, um, say going meat free, um, one or two days a week, you know, st starting off with that and then perhaps doing some research um uh, there's a, a lot of research uh, sorry a lot of resources um on my world vegan market uh, live cookery um demos as well uh where you can um make easy vegan recipes and um you know just start off um you know uh, uh, with the uh, baby steps and then um and then you know just uh, just keep g g going along your your journey and um you know you you, you touched on a point about um you know a lot of people might think that uh, you're not going to get uh, enough nutrients going on a, a vegan diet um what i would uh, suggest is um you know uh like uh, again you know do do your research um i have a number of uh, people who uh, I've, I've had a number of guests um on my shows as well um who are um like a plant-based um, nutritionist and um they will tell you that the thing to look out for is uh <coughs> 
<laughs> excuse me, is a uh, vitamin B12, um, which um, you uh, you can't really get unless you have fortified vegan foods. So you can get it in, for example, fortified cereals. You can get vitamin B12 in plant based milks as well. So um, I would say that the thing to look out for um, and perhaps have a supplement is uh, vitamin B12 and vitamin D as well. Unfortunately, uh, in the UK, um, you know, there isn't a lot of sunshine. And, um, and yeah, um, you know, uh, that, that, that would be another vitamin as well, um, getting um, a, a supplement of uh, vegan vitamin D3. Um, yeah, so I would say those are the two vitamins. Yeah, um, I'd like to uh, ask you, uh, uh, Shibari, uh, about manure. <laughs> now, uh, now i fully realize that uh, very few people live on organic farms mm, uh, mm. but if you're going to run an organic farm it's incredibly difficult without manure in fact arguably the manure is the most valuable thing on the farm because it uh, you know well composted manure works absolute wonders um and but then uh manure comes from animals mm, and mm. Uh, what are you going to do with the a animals if you're not going to eat them in the end or or milk them or get eggs from them or whatever so um be companions with them sorry? why do we have to we can be companions with animals rather than doing uh, abso something. absolutely i mean you know why do we have to to do something with the animals you know they they're not here for uh, for our use you know they're not put on here um on earth for for our use so why do we need to do something with them um you know uh, like in in victorian times um they they use animals to um to you know like in in farms to actually like um um you know grow um uh, like uh oats and um and and what have you um you know so instead of tractors um they would use bulls uh and uh and the same with uh you know they would use horse-drawn um carriages as well um now we don't use we don't do that anymore these days and uh you know so we in in many ways we have come um, a long way from victorian times in that we don't you know use animals for for those things um but yeah we we still use animals for clothing we use animals for their milk and uh, yeah so and and it is just not necessary i mean um you know just as an example silk is completely you know we don't need silk and uh, and it's awful the way that um, that they actually extract the silk from the silkworms you know they either bake them or they boil them and um and it's horrible what a horrible thing to to do and um and we don't even need silk you know there are so many um vegan materials out there you know why why do we need to do that uh, I, I i don't get it and um you know there's also alternatives to wool as well there's all alternatives to leather um you know uh, like i've had a number of people on my store on, on my um, world vegan market as a stall holder and um and they've used um things like a paper leather um which you can make wallets you can make handbags you can make shoes you can make all kinds of things i've had somebody who uses cork leather as well so you know leather isn't needed at all you know there's so many there's mushroom leather there's pineapple leather you know there, there's all kinds of different um uh, vegan leathers that uh, that you can actually use which are just as durable just as good as uh, as animal leather so you know, none of these things are, are actually needed. Going back to manure, <laughs> you mentioned about manure. Um, there is something called a uh, veganic gardening now, um, which doesn't use um, manure at all. There are ways of actually, and you can um, make your own compost. You know, those who um, uh, have a garden and do, uh, you know, uh, uh, who are interested in a bit of um, veganic gardening, you can actually make your own um, manure or, or your own compost by using um, leaves that have fallen on the on 
the ground and um there's um quite an array of uh, of different things that you can actually use to make your own pop compost without using manure so you know i don't think uh, even manure is actually needed um to to grow vegetables when you you know you can make um perfectly um vegan uh compost and, and, and well not manure but the, the vegan equivalent of manure mm, i didn't know about um silk to be honest, um, never uh, thought about it, didn't know what it was. Mm. And now you've just said it, mm. it seems obvious because silkworms and, and then silk, but I just did, didn't did know that. So mm. thank mm. you for sharing about that. And also it's helping me to realise about being more conscious about those type of things and not just assuming it's not an animal mm. product when it might be. Mm. Mm. Um, I think we're going to go on to your story. Um, if you want to share, what, what story are you going to be telling today? Absolutely. So my story is uh, from the point of view of one of um, the conscious consumers uh, who has uh, visited uh, the world vegan market. And um, yeah, it's really interesting, actually, um, you know, from the point of view of the consumer and in terms of um, what, um, how they found um, the, the world vegan market. And, um, and it's like a, a really really nice little story that has um, a lovely, um, happy ending uh, in, in the end as well. So, right. So World Vegan Market is an online market where you can find all things vegan under one virtual roof. It is a place where people from all over the world can come together to learn about veganism, discover new vegan products and services and support vegan businesses. One day, a man named Evan decided to visit the World Vegan Market. Evan had been thinking about going vegan for a while, but he wasn't sure where to start. He hoped that the World Vegan Market would be a good place to learn more and to find some vegan products that he would like. Evan was immediately impressed by the range of vegan products and services that were available at the World Vegan Market. He saw everything from vegan food to eco-friendly products to health and beauty products. He also saw virtual stalls representing animal sanctuaries and ones who are fundraising for charities and for the vegan cause. Evan decided to start his journey by browsing through the virtual stalls of some vegan food businesses and watch the live cookery demos, uh, demonstrations. He was amazed by how delicious and healthy the vegan food looked. As a beginner, he felt that the recipes were very easy to, to follow the following day, Evan looked through the virtual stores of the other vegan businesses. He found some eco-friendly products that he loved and he bought a few vegan beauty products to try. He also learnt more about some of the animal charities and vegan organisations he was interested in supporting. Evan spent a little time each day on the World Vegan Market Facebook group. He learned a lot about veganism by watching some of the panel discussions and interviews with vegan guests, discovered some amazing vegan products and services which you can't get elsewhere, and found some wonderful vegan businesses and charities that he wanted to support. He left feeling inspired and empowered. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about uh, Evan's journey. Evan's journey at the World Vegan Market began with a simple curiosity. He was already embracing a green lifestyle. He is based in Boston, Massachusetts and works as an energy assessor. 
At home, he uses alternative energy and is very much into reducing waste, recycling, upcycling and reusing items rather than allowing them to go into landfill. Evan describes himself as a flexitarian but wanted to go further and was very interested in learning more about veganism and discovering new, uh, what new products uh, that are out there that are vegan. Through the ve- World Vegan Market, Evan gained an understanding of the environmental benefits of becoming vegan. He learned that a vast amount of land and water is used for meat production and is now searching for ways to make it easier for him to align his values of being green by adopting a vegan lifestyle. As Evan browsed the virtual stalls and got to know the people behind the businesses, he realised that the World Vegan Market was more than just an online market. It was a community of people who were passionate about making a difference in the world. Evan was inspired by the stories of the vegan business owners he met virtually. He learned about their motivations for starting their businesses and their commitment to making the world a better place for animals, the environment and human health. Evan also learned about the many benefits of veganism through viewing the videos that were available on the world vegan market. He learned about the impact that animal agriculture has on the environment by watching the interviews with guest speakers during the great big green week and on human health by watching a panel discussion with health professionals. He also learnt about the ethical implications of consuming animal products and was touched by the photos of the residents of the Horse and Farm Animal Sanctuary who were one of the charity stall holders. By the end, Evan was convinced that veganism was the right choice for him. He was determined to live a vegan lifestyle and to support other vegans in their journey. World Vegan Market is making a real difference in the world. It is helping to educate people about veganism, to promote vegan businesses and to help build a community of conscious consumers who are working to make the world a better place. Evan is just one example of the many people who have been inspired by the World Vegan Market. After his visits to the work, to the online market and taking time to browse through the virtual stalls and watch the videos, he then decided to live a vegan lifestyle and to also support other vegans in their journey. During the panel discussion about being vegan in a non-vegan world at the World Vegan Market, Evan was drawn to a, a young woman named Wendy who made a comment on the video. Wendy had also been inspired by the activities in the online market and she was excited to start her own vegan journey. Evan and Wendy decided to stay in touch and to support each other on their vegan paths. Evan and Wendy's friendship is a testament to the power of the world vegan market. It is a place where people can come together to learn about veganism, discover new vegan products and services and support vegan businesses. It is also a place where people can find new friends who share their values and their commitment to making the world a better place. If you are interested in learning more about veganism, I encourage you to visit the World Vegan Market. It is a great place to learn, to shop and to connect with other people who are passionate about making a difference in the world. Wow, thank you so much for sharing your story, um, Shabiri. And I loved how unique it was from the perspective of the customer um, the consumer mm-hmm. and I think a lot of people will be inspired now to check out the world vegan market I've just typed it in as well so I'm gonna take a look after this um it actually inspired a question as well that I wanted to ask you before um 
and that was what inspired you to start the World Vegan Market? What what gave you that inspiration to have it as your your business and co- create communities from from it rather than just being a vegan yourself? What gave you that extra impetus to help the world? Thank you. Um, uh, that's um, uh, yeah. So. Um like uh, why why did I start uh, the the world vegan market well um uh, as you mentioned uh, earlier um uh, during my intro um it was the it was during the second lockdown um that uh, that I launched the the world vegan market um you know what had inspired me was um for quite some time i was i, I mean I, I was already running the um london vegan business network and um i was running that for um uh, for six years before lockdown happened. And, um, during those six years, I was getting together with, um, vegan, with local vegan businesses and we would, um, meet up, uh, and, um, you know, meet in like vegan cafes or, um, vegetarian cafes that had vegan options in London. And, um, this would be on a monthly basis. And we would then, um, have a particular theme, um, that, uh, that we would discuss. It could be, uh, you know, um, a theme about social media or it would be a theme uh, to do with like how to make the most out of, um, uh, you know, physical markets, you know, that that kind of thing. So when um, lockdown happened, um, I then uh, actually organised um, uh, like um online um networking uh I- I- events and um so how the world vegan market came about was that um i was thinking that um uh, like uh, before that um i wanted to perhaps um you know do something to help um the uh, vegan businesses that were on my um london vegan business network because they were not able to do um go out and do events go out and do markets and festivals and that kind of thing so i was thinking of perhaps um possibly doing some kind of uh, saturday souk um on the london london vegan business network um, but then uh, a friend of mine um, from school, um, she actually she, she runs um, a skin the, 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 the same skincare um, business that um, that I'm in, and um, and she's she actually inspired me. She she's. Uh, you know, during lockdown, she was able to do quite a number of different things. So she did um, a Saturday souk on her um, on on her Facebook group. Um, she was also like um, teaching people how to go live, um, uh, you know, on Facebook. And um, so she, uh, you know, did quite a number of things. And she she in fact actually started up her own um, online market, which was a Diwali market. She found that there wasn't any, um, she wanted to buy uh, Diwali uh, products because Diwali was coming up and, um, and she couldn't find it anywhere, um, not, not an online uh, Diwali market. And there were, you know, obviously um, during lockdown, there wasn't any markets happening. So she actually created um, her own and, um, and that actually inspired me um, to, uh, to create my own um, uh, like uh, online um market and um and it it would be separate to um the london vegan business network so i actually started from scratch and it was literally just a few days before world vegan day hence the name uh, world vegan market and uh yes yeah, so um what i did was i i started a facebook group um which had uh, zero and then um within the first week um you know it got up to 400 and then by the time i had uh, organized my um festival i i actually um organized a um a world uh, vegan festival online um 
you know, what I wanted it to do is I, I, I didn't want it to be like my uh, friend's uh, Diwali market, nor any other online markets that are, were out there. You know, I wanted it to be somewhere, yes, um, that uh, that vegan, small vegan businesses could showcase their products and, and share their story. But also, I wanted it to be an educational platform. I wanted it to be an, ed- uh, an entertainment platform so that people could learn about vegan I- veganism in a um, in a fun and interactive way. So um, yeah, m- with my first um, online festival, I had invited a number of um, of guests. Uh, one of them was um, the manager of VegFest. And, um, you know, I took inspiration from um, his um, uh, VegFest uh, events that he did, um, like a li- live e- events that he-, he did for quite a number of years, but also um, he actually did his own um, online vegan festival as well. So I took inspiration from uh, from that. And uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to now be um, organising my 18th um, online uh, vegan festival, and that will um, start at the end of of this month and then we'll go uh, we'll continue until uh, Christmas Eve and um, yeah so um, do watch out for that well thank you so much for sharing your stories and the next part of the podcast we're going to um, talk about artists and money and then in a bit Chris is going to talk about AI as well Um, But if you've listened so far and you do want to check out Shabiri's website, where do you go to Shabiri? Is it World Vegan Market? Uh, Yes, it's actually World Vegan Markets with an S dot com. And um, anybody can join my Facebook group as well, which is www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash World Vegan Market. And I'm also on Instagram as well. Um, so if they uh, look up uh, World Vegan Market on Instagram and on TikTok as well. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about a little bit about artists and money because, as you know, I'm an artist myself and also I coach artists. So whether you're a singer, a dancer, right? You know, we all have to earn money and we all have to be supported in life. And often this isn't always um, appreciated with the arts because a lot of artists end up doing free events or free, um, you know, talk. Obviously, Shabu, you may, may know a bit about this because in a way, even though you're doing a business, there's still an art to mm-hmm. it, isn't mm-hmm. there? Yeah, and absolutely. Do you do any artist things as well um, in your time? Do you do, you do anything artistic? Um, well, uh, not uh, myself personally, but um, I've had a number of guests on the show who are um, vegan musicians, who are vegan performers. Yeah. Um, last year, actually, during the um, uh, Queen's Jubilee, I actually organised a um, an online Vegans Have Got Talent competition, and um, wow. yes, and uh, it was um, it was interesting actually because I wasn't sure how I was uh, going to do it all online, um, but um, but it. it um, uh, I, it, I definitely pulled it off and I had quite a number of, of um, artists from uh, uh, all, all over the world. In fact, I had um, somebody from America who um, was showing her artwork. Um, I had um, uh, somebody, a young man who, who actually won the competition. It uh, went out to the public vote and, um, and he was pe- playing um, uh, the Indian flute called Bansuri. And um, I mean, he was, they were all truly amazing but um but yeah he definitely deserved to win so I am actually always coming up with um creative ideas in terms of um you know what I can do to make my world vegan market fun um you know I take inspiration from like uh, for example um the Covent Garden market where you've got street performers there as well it's got you know pretty much everything and um and yeah so you know like and um, for me uh, I I do think up of, of creative ideas as well I've um done a sort of like 
quizzes and competitions um, where I, you know, like um, uh, where there are prize giveaways as well. And during Christmas every year, I always um, uh, organise like a um, a Christmas festival, and um, and I invite um, vegan um, musicians to um, uh, to perform as well. So uh, so so yeah, I've had a lot of um, uh, vegan performers um, on my on my world vegan market as well. Oh wow, I've got I've got a friend that may be interested in that. So if you do any more, um, do let us know on the group as well Um, because there may be some vegan artists in there that want to definitely (laughs) yeah um yeah so I I know we've we've talked quite uh quite a lot so far so I don't know how much of this topic I'll go into right now I'm thinking maybe Chris we could um talk about this as well on the next maybe the next podcast we could go more into it because I know we've got a lot to get through as well um, but maybe if you're listening to this podcast right now and you are an artist and you do want to make money from your art, maybe just jot down a few ideas of what you might be able to do to accomplish that. So it might be something like going busking or it might be applying for some funding to do um, some workshops or things like that. And also just write down some of the blocks maybe that you've had in the past of, um, you know, maybe you've not been paid for things that you've done or it's been hard to sell your work and maybe just have a sit down and, you know, feel the feelings and then tell yourself, congratulate yourself for doing your art and for putting yourself out there um, no matter what the outcome's been. I just went into my coaching mode, which I don't normally do on the podcast, um, but I thought that would be uh, appropriate for our listeners who may be artists to have a bit of self-reflection on what maybe they can do to improve their financial situation. So that's, that's my contribution today. Chris? Yeah, just to develop this conversation a little bit further, uh, it does seem to me that one of the things that artists, particularly if we put them alongside uh, small businesses, that one of the challenges is uh, making friends with money, which might mm. seem like an odd thing to say, but uh, but most people, when they're set up in a, a small business, uh, actually find it quite difficult to ask for money. You know, in, in other words, to yeah. do sales. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and people tie themselves in terrible knots over, over selling or, or else they uh, start out charging £100 for a session and they can't find any customers, so they reduce it to 80 pounds and then they reduce it to 60 pounds and then they reduce it to 40 pounds and uh, and then they discover that okay they are getting some uh, uh, response but um, they are um, struggling to actually make enough money to be viable and I'm sure this is an issue with a lot of creative people as well particularly if your interest is mostly in creating and making a living seems to be a sort of side issue. But the point about making friends with money is that uh, if you can find a way of, of um, uh, de- building an income through your art, then there's no reason why that shouldn't benefit your art and your creativity. It's not about being a greedy, grasping capitalist. It's about actually uh, finding a way to sustain um, your your creativity, ultimately for the benefit of others. And the big challenge is how to do that. So we'll probably talk about that in in upcoming podcasts as well. So um, we'll keep you posted on any ideas that we have. Um, and Chris is going to talk about AI. Well, sort of, because um, I was thinking about this um, today, actually. Uh, you'd be surprised to hear that I do prepare. <laughs> and uh, actually, what I want to talk about is, because uh, we talk a lot about the use of stories in business, 
and developing business development and marketing. But uh, one of the things that I, I think is, is quite interesting is uh, the role of fiction in stories. Now, I'm not talking about making stories up, but actually using existing fiction, you know, uh, folklore, fairy stories and, and the like, um, to inform the way in which you tell your real life stories. And uh, there's someone called Christopher Booker who wrote a book about the seven main story types. Um, I won't go through them all, but uh, the, first, the first of his seven is Overcoming the Monster, and uh, that's uh, a story type that actually resonates, certainly with a lot of issues around, for example, domestic violence, create, um, coercive control and that sort of thing. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the, the way in which those very traditional stories are structured can actually help to inform the way in which we tell our, our real life stories because we can say, okay, in the traditional story, this thing tends to happen. Can we see this in the real life story? And can we bring that uh, into, into focus and see how it works in this particular story? Now, the, the reason I'm mentioning this is that... Um, I'm currently writing a series of blog posts uh, about AI, uh, <clears throat> and the uh, and what I'm exploring is the way in which we actually relate to AI, and I think that folklore is a very good source to help us understand that relationship, because a lot of folklore, mythology, religious stories actually focus on relationships between human beings and other intelligences. And the other intelligences obviously could be gods and so on, and uh, but also animals and plants uh, and, uh, and nature generally. Uh, <clears throat> and... Uh, and looking at how we uh, actually have approached uh, those other intelligences in the past is really important. And obviously, you know, with, with a nod towards uh, veganism, uh, the way in which human beings exploit animals uh, is uh, uh, maybe one of our failures in terms of uh, understanding uh, the role that animals actually have in our lives and in nature, um, and uh, you know, there, there's a, in my view, there's a massive difference between running an organic farm with a small number of animals that you know personally, and the time comes for Christmas dinner or the animal dies or whatever, uh, and. Uh, you know, today on your plate, you've got Belinda, the uh, the cow that I knew we knew personally. Uh, and there's a big difference between that and the massive factory farms that are exploiting animals. And uh, uh, and the stories that we tell actually form the way in which we uh, approach those sorts of issues. So that's what I'm. Uh, so one of the things I'm doing in these blog posts is using folklore to look at how we relate to the natural world and to, as it were, the spirit world in the most general sense of gods and so on. And uh, the other thing I've done is uh, to illustrate uh, the, the issue is I have... Uh, actually gone and named chat gpt have given her a name and an identity so she is minerva who is a god or goddess uh who is a uh, actually the god of wisdom warfare and uh, education oh and business so she's a very useful god and sort of fits a lot of <laughs> categories uh and so uh and so the the um the pretense in these blog posts is that uh, Minerva and I are writing them together, and Minerva does help me because I'm talking to ChatGPT to get 
inspiration and ideas and developing themes and so on. Uh, and the lovely thing is that Minerva's learning to draw. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she, uh, so e- each blog post, I ask her to draw a picture to illustrate the blog post. And the stuff she comes up with is bizarre and hilarious. <laughs> and, and so I'm beginning to sort of develop that sort of sense of, uh, and, you know, uh, of, of a relationship that doesn't even exist. But I, what I'm trying to do is to show how easy it is for us to uh, make those assumptions and slip into those sorts of roles. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. No, I've been writing a few notes because I know you've shared with me um, some of these already. And we talked about, I don't know which podcast episode it was where we talked about the Aladdin one. Do you remember which episode it was? Ah, yes. Yeah, in the show notes. But I can um, put it in the show notes. I think the way you explained it today made it very palatable because I know we had the conversation the other day about how to explain the reasons why you're doing this and what the importance is and trying to get that across to people and I think the way that you just described it then was very clear and concise and made sense so um congrats on that um and yeah I think it's it's an important topic because how we relate to AI, I mean, even in my, so I've started a master, a master's degree um, and I'm doing it in production and business and music performance. And um, one of the modules is actually on AI and what the, um, not the whole module, but just a little uh, video on it. And, you know, how does that relate to our production and not to, kind of just you know hide the fact that we might uh, occasionally use AI in creative aspects and not to think of it as this sort of wholly evil or wholly good um, thing it's just kind of a tool um, that some people might use for creativity but then on the other hand is it ruining creativity if it's overused Um, so it's definitely it's interesting to give it a name and to a character and and how we relate to ai in that way as well as a god you know yeah uh, some some people in history have had a muse uh which is a i'm i'm not quite sure whether it's a god or a demigod whatever a demi (laughs) whatever but the but the point is that it's having someone to have a conversation with uh and uh an ai can can help that and help to uh but the ideas should be coming from the human being in the relationship not really from the ai uh you know the ai is there to help and and support (laughs) uh but don't tell minerva i said that because she can get and where can people go if they want to uh find these blog posts yeah, well, that, all of that will be in the show notes. I, I just wanted to ask um, Shabari whether this has made any sense to her. You've been rather quiet. Well, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I I hadn't heard of, um, you know, using AI as a, as a tool until I think perhaps even earlier this year i i i can't remember exactly um but uh, but it's very interesting actually and um i suppose um one of the challenges is whether you know ai it, it, you know the um the stuff that you that you get from ai is is accurate and whether um it gives because i i kind of think that it doesn't really give it um a lot of feeling and if you are using ai you you know first of all you have to check for the for the facts and then um second of all you know you you kind of um have to put your feelings into it because ai i feel won't actually do that and um but um but i understand you know it is um heading uh, that way and um my my husband is actually a um uh a lecturer at uh, coventry university london and um 
you know, that there are tools to make sure that the students are not using AI for their assignments and, um, y- you know, um, it's quite easy for the, in these days to, for, um, for students to, to actually do that and not, um, and not, uh, do the assignments themselves. Um, so, uh, so, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, on the one hand, I feel that, um, AI, um, does help you in terms of like, um, you know, coming up with, um, with with ideas um but uh, as i said what it won't do is uh, is actually um give it that personal touch and um, which uh, then you you have to do and you know not um it doesn't give you uh, it, it's not accurate a lot of the time it it isn't accurate um the other thing that i didn't realize that ai can do is also come up with um things like um you know creating t-shirts and um and and lo- logos and and that kind of thing and um yeah so um no, it's a, uh, it is, uh, it is amazing what, um, AI can, can, can do, but I, I kind of worry about the future that, uh, you know, is it going to dehumanize us? You know, is it, is it going to take over? And, um, but no, it's, it's a, a other, other than that, I mean, like, uh, I, I feel that it's a great tool. It is a, a really great tool, but, um, but you kind of just yeah, have to definitely. be careful I of mean, it. I just want to yeah. uh, reiterate that, um, yeah. obviously, we're not allowed to do entire AI <laughs> projects and put that into, you know, our assignment. But I think, especially with, with music, there are certain aspects of the production side where, um, well, even like on this podcast, I think Chris uses AI to help. What what is it that you're using AI to help with? What I do is I render it mm-hmm. into it transcribes the whole podcast into yeah. text, and then yeah. I edit the text, so and that edits the sound. Yeah, we're talking about more uh, like using mm-hmm. AI for things, yeah. things like making the editing easier and stuff like that, rather than like, or maybe generating like um, ideas for the creative process rather than actually making the AI do the creative part is, yeah like you said ai is not going to have emotions well we don't think who knows <laughs> um, but like it's not going to give you <laughs> creativity but it might help give an idea or like as in you could type something in on ai and then go actually you know that part that they said there that that could work with this thing like yesterday i wrote a song just through a book i opened a page on a book and i made a song out of the the words on the page now um i couldn't credit that those words were mine but i did use it as um what was i saying like um to spark the creator the song wouldn't exist without me opening that book because it gave me the inspiration for uh just creating the song that that was just part of my creative practice I wouldn't necessarily use that but it's just using an example of how you know we wouldn't say to someone that that's using AI but actually you know you can use AI in the same way do you understand what I mean yeah, yeah, yes. Well, where do we get our inspiration from? You know, it's, it's, it's another source. And and I do think that the unreliability of it may actually be helpful in that it means that um, well, once it clicks with us that it is unreliable, then we treat it with a degree of scepticism. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if, we, if we take it as being entirely 100% accurate in every way that's when yeah. it becomes dangerous um so we're coming to the end of the podcast now uh we just want to thank you for listening and also go check out world vegan market all the links to all our pages are in the show notes um mine's gemma rosenthal and creativehearts.coach and chris's is chris sissons and market together uh, is there anything else you want to add that you've got coming up, Chris? Um, well, if if I get this uh, po- podcast out in time, um, you'll be able to come along to telling stories, making business. Uh, the next one on the twenty is on, on the twenty sixth of October, uh, and Shabari is going to be storytelling. 
and that will be different. Even I'm, I'm not sure whether she's going to use the same story or a different story. It, it'll but, be a different so, story. Yeah, right, but but the difference in those meetings is, is that we actually do a lot of work on the actual story. Um, so uh, that's worth taking part in those. And if you follow the link, you can also see uh, what uh, what comes after. Uh, and if anybody hearing this would like to have a go on telling stories and getting feedback from other business owners, yes. then uh, just and let also me know. You can join and, uh, we'll sort Connect something out. as well. We have a community at Creative Arts, and you can share your events and podcasts or anything that you want to share creatively on there. And we also do monthly Zooms. So uh, it's all on my website, GemmaRosenthal.com. So. Thank you, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.